so we're going to get started. Um, so good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to all of our friends um, here in the U.S. and all around the world. It's so exciting um, to see more than 200 participants um, here tonight from so many different countries. So thank you all so much uh, for joining us for this very special book launch of our new multi-author book, Hope and Joy in Education, Engaging Daisaku Ikeda Across Curriculum and Context. This book was published by Teachers College Press and developed in association with the Ikeda Center for Peace, Learning and Dialogue. My name is Lillian and I am the program manager here at the Ikeda Center and it is my honor to be your MC for the evening. For those of you who are new to the center, uh, I thought I could share um, a little background on who we are. We were founded in 1993, and our mission since then has been to build cultures of peace through learning and dialogue. Our founder, Daisaku Ikeda, whose works are at the center of this new book, is a peace builder, writer, educator, and Buddhist leader. As someone who has experienced firsthand the sufferings and tragedies of war, Mr. Ikeda has dedicated his life to the pursuit of peace through education and dialogue. He established this center with the hopes that it would be a spiritual sanctuary where people, in his words, can come and heal the wounds of the alienated lesser self and open pathways to our true self, the greater self. His deep desire for and commitment to peace are what inspire and inform all of our programs and publications. So tonight, uh, we are thrilled to explore with all of you this very timely publication, which features 18 chapters by incredible authors from diverse disciplines, considering and affirming the many places across curriculum and context where hope and joy are or can be strong and vibrant. In these chapters, each author engages in the life-affirming ideals of Mr. Ikeda, and how it relates to their own lives and the lives of their students. We're so honored to have our most hopeful um, and joyful book editors with us this evening, Dr. Isabel Nunez, Professor of Educational Studies and Director of the School of Education at Purdue University, Fort Wayne, and Dr. Jason Gula, Professor of Bilingual Bicultural Education and Director of the Institute for Daisaku Ikeda Studies and Education at DePaul University in Chicago. They will be leading us in this exploration from the inspiration behind the book to the process of creating it to the significance of it in this crucial time in our country and the world at large. As someone who has witnessed the two of them in action, uh, I can say with certainty that we're all in for a treat tonight. In Dr. Gula's introduction to the book, he shares that in this historical moment, hope and joy can feel quite distant which is why we deeply feel that the theme of this book is more important and vital than ever. We're very fortunate to have received beautiful endorsements from Hope and Joy in for, for Hope and Joy in Education. And today I'd like to share one from Dr. Awad Ibrahim of University of Ottawa that I feel speaks powerfully to this current moment. It reads, having witnessed the worst of humanity, Daisaku Ikeda reminds us that the urgency of the moment requires us to hope, since to hope is to live. With these words in mind, we hope tonight's discussion and this volume will inspire you to explore hope and joy in your own life. So without further delay, it is my pleasure to welcome to this virtual stage, Dr. Nunez and Dr. Gula, along with our events and publications coordinator, Henri Tanabe, who will be moderating the conversation this evening. So thank you so much. Thank you, Lillian, and good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm so excited and honored to be here with Isabel and Jason and all of you to have a conversation about the much anticipated book, Hope and Joy in Education, Engaging Daisaku Ikeda Across Curriculum and Context. Before we jump into the discussion, I just wanted to let everyone know that there will be time for Q&A uh, later on. So if you have any questions for Isabel and Jason uh, throughout the panel, please use the Q&A function, which is located at the bottom of your screen. 
So I know we're all eager to get started and to learn more about the book, which offers such an empowering message to all, whether you are a student, teacher, educator, parent, or someone who really wants to see a change in our school and in our society. So tonight, in addition to learning about some of the content in the book, which we hope that you'll have a chance to read soon, we have some time with the editor. So let's start at the very beginning with some background on the inspiration behind the project and how it came to be. So I wanted to ask you, Jason and Isabel, um, if you could talk a little bit about what was the process like in bringing this book to life? And can you share with us about any particular moment or situation that really solidified this idea? Sure. Isabel, do you want to go first? Um, sure. I, I, I feel like joy has been really central to my vocation since I started teaching and I don't know, maybe even before, but um, I was a first grade teacher in Los Angeles. And if we weren't having fun, kids weren't learning as much. You know? um, when, when we were enjoying ourselves, um, we just a lot more learning got done. And, um, and it has gotten harder and harder to have fun in education for the past few decades, right? Uh, the, it, this isn't new. This has been, you know, since probably back to a nation at risk and certainly no child left behind, like it has gotten harder and harder to be hopeful and joyful and to care about education. And, um, and so that has made me just more intent on finding that joy, you know, finding and spreading it wherever I can. So that, that was probably the, the, the backstory to the book for me. I remember, um, so Isabel and I have been on a number of panels over the years uh, at different professional organizations and Daisaku Ikeda's name has come up in, in a variety of ways. And, you know, because I'm at the Institute uh, for uh, Daisaku Ikeda studies in education and have been researching his work, I've been looking to do some kind of project that brings a lot of voices together to engage with his work. But I remember Isabel and I were talking and I said, well, if you really want to sort of understand Daisaku Ikeda's major sort of worldview, I recommend the series, The Wisdom of the Lotus Sutra. It's six volumes and you know, Isabel, classic Isabel, just read it immediately. And we were talking about it and somehow it came out like, what is the main sort of theme that comes through in that entire series for you? And she said, joy, joy comes through loudly and clearly for me in this whole work. And I said, oh, that's interesting. For me, it's hope. And I think for Ikeda, both of those are not kind of Pollyanna mm -hmm. sort of ways of thinking about those terms, which we often can think about them in that way. Just, oh, if we just hope, then it'll be okay. Or if we just have joy, you know, we pretend like everything's okay. And neither of those are the case. But then we started talking, oh, why don't we do something around hope and joy as the central kind of focus of a book and ask people to think about those ideas the way Ikeda talks about them in the context of their own work with their own students or around themes that they have been working with for a long time. And I would say without any discussion, it's sort of like that, yes, let's do that. That is something we need. This is before the pandemic, yeah. before George Floyd, before a lot of the things that we're struggling with right now, we thought there is a need for these two ideas in the sort of the kind of determined hope that Daisaku Ikeda talks about. And even though it sounds strange, this kind of seriousness about joy, you know, that he talks about it with an intentional kind of joy uh, that comes from really creating meaning in life. Um, that if we can bring these into education, then there really is something new for people who are struggling and in this system of education, which does have a lot of places of hope and joy present, but also can feel like it's just in free fall for everyone, for parents, students, um, certainly for educators, leaders, <clears throat> educational scholars. Uh, we wanted to kind of inject hope and joy into the conversation again. So I think that that's sort of how it happened. And then we had the opportunity to go to Japan 
mm. and go visit Soka University and Soka High School. And it was such a joyful and hopeful kind of trip that it sort of cemented these ideas for us, I think. So. Yes. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing. I, um, Isabel, I know in your uh, introduction, you know, you talked about how uh, joy was like a decision that you made. And I love how, Jay, um, Jason, you um, mentioned about how difficult it is to um, create hope and joy in moments of really like distress. And so um, I was really inspired, Isabel, by your, um, your just explaining, you know, how um, in the moment where you felt so um, lost in, in your college years that you were able to decide like to choose to, to live joyfully. Um, and so it's amazing that, you know, your relationship to bring um, this topic together. And um, I know you had this great idea. So then next, you know, I really want to ask, how did you go about, you know, deciding what kind of um, scholars to ask? I know there's uh, 18 chapters, which include 22 different scholars from very diverse backgrounds. So um, if you could talk a little bit about, you know, what that process was like, um, We'd love to hear, you know, what were kind of kind of the responses when you presented this idea uh, to the scholars? Yeah, so I'm thinking back on it, it was, you know, two and a half years ago or something like that, right? It was, or it was a while ago. And so it, it seems kind of sweet and naive for us to be thinking about how hard things were then and how much we need hope and joy when, you know, we hit hadn't hit anything in 2020 yet um but um but at the time i remember we were um we were talking about authors um in um in fall and i was at the um bergamo conference the um, journal for curriculum theorizing conference and um and jason and i were talking on the phone and I was in my little um, monk cell room in um, at Bergamo and just thinking about the presentations that I'd seen and thinking about the people that I know whose work has emotional resonance, right? So, um, so thinkers whose scholarly work isn't centered up here, right? But is centered somewhere else, right? Like, it, deeper and, um, and wholer. And so there are certainly people that I thought of because they embody joy and embody hope and just being around them um, makes one feel more joyful and hopeful. Um, but, but others who are, I just, I knew would grapple with these ideas on, on, a, on a deeper level than just intellect. Yeah, I think uh, I remember that very well. And, you know, I think everyone who has contributed to this book, um, you know, we have really established scholars and some emerging new voices that are bringing really wonderful perspectives to education and to Ikeda's ideas. But I think at the heart, we, we really respect all of these individuals as human beings, first and foremost, and then really respect their work. I mean, they've been writing some things that we've been following for a long time. And I think we wanted a, a broad kind of set of voices, broad in terms of context, broad in terms of the disciplines that they're writing from, people who can bring sort of new things to uh, new ways of making meaning from Daisaku Ikeda's writings. And then also people whose work, at least I'll speak for myself, people who I thought their work would benefit from an engagement with Daisaku Ikeda would sort of bring a new kind of lens to the ways they were thinking about the important topics that they were taking up. And to our surprise, everyone said yes. I mean, everyone immediately yeah. said yes. <laughs> and they said, we'll get into it. And um, then started pouring into uh, different works from Ikeda. And um, some people were pulling on other works and finding things. and. Some people invited some of their colleagues and students. And um, as a project, uh, we were all talking as a project, we were reading it since it came out like as a book rather than as editors, sort of as a finished thing. And we're, it far surpassed my, my anticipation, what I thought it was gonna be. It's like a thousand times better than I thought. So I'm really excited. And uh, 
really pleased to have these voices uh, a part of it. Um, they're, they're really beautiful chapters. Yeah. yeah. I, um, I was just um, saying earlier that I, I, I reread it in the past like four days um, at, as a reader and, and not as an editor. And, um, and all of the chapters are, are beautiful and amazing. Um, but I just I wanted to share about two of them that that were really meaningful to me on this like, reading as a as a reader, and one and uh, being a very selfish person because they're both so useful to me right now, and one of them is really useful to me as a, a professional right as a as a professor as a teacher, and one is really useful to me as a person. Um, but um, Melissa Bradford's chapter on um on teaching dialogue and and i feel like i've gone in this direction but not as far as she has and um and so i'm i'm already thinking okay i've got to redo my class i've got to redo my assignments um because the way that she teaches her students to have inner dialogue and outer dialogue and for purposes of you know being better um, in their in their work and in their worlds is 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 just amazing. So I I'm really thankful um, to Melissa. And then the one that um, that I just love personally for for me right now is um, um, Johnny Lucanacci's um, chapter on, and in particular what he he says about dependency. And I am I am so guilty of you know like I am I am an island and I am an island for the good of you know, people around me so I can be, you know, whole and benefit. I was like, no, I, I need people. I, um, I, I need to acknowledge my own dependency and, um, and, and how much I am interconnected with others. And, and so I'm going to reread that chapter probably multiple times before I really get the message, but thank you, Johnny, for that chapter. The, um, the, authors really rose to the occasion because we asked them to oh, do yeah. a kind of um, sort of mental gymnastics of sorts. You know, it was like, take Daisaku Ikeda's ideas around hope and joy, bring them in the context of your work, uh, be kind of conversational, but also be scholarly. And we had all of these requests. <laughs> and you read these chapters and they are like, they're, it's like they're talking to you. And, um, you know, just thinking of Johnny's, you get this great reflection on the movement from how he was as a teacher and throwing himself into his teaching in the most sincere way and then coming to a realization through Ikeda's work and others that what he was doing was really imposing on students, imposing a kind of way of teaching that may have resonated with some but wasn't really coming from the heart as Isabel was saying earlier. And it wasn't from a place of hope and joy. It was sort of almost like running without really knowing what to do. And there's a kind of realization in the way he writes about it and how, taking a cue from Ikeda, how to really bring uh, value, how to create value in that space. Um, and at the same time, he's couching it entirely in all of the eco-critical work that he's been doing for years, so it's really well done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely um, agree that I I love the story aspect of being able to to read about the scholars and hearing about their personal lives. And apart from you know the amazing work they're doing, I really felt like um, that we could be friends, you know, or <laughs> just being able to learn so much about um, their backgrounds through through reading this book. Um, and I know some of them are on the call today, so congratulations and thank you for being here. Um, so I wanted to shift directions to, um, you mentioned this in the beginning, Jason, a little bit, but um, in the middle of writing this book, of course, um, we were hit with the global pandemic and we were witnessing the horrific killing of George Floyd and other countless acts of racism in the United States. And Isabel and Jason, you both you both write about these moments in your chapters um, and how challenging um, to bring to bring hope and joy amidst these circumstances, how challenging that is, but highlighting how important it is in this crucial time, um, especially within the context of education. So I was wondering if you could share a little bit about how the book 
really fits within the context of what's happening in 2020 and mm. um, in what ways, you know, does the book turn out to be a vital educational contribution in this moment? I, I have to say it really wasn't easy um, for me. It, this past summer, you know, the, the chapters were pr pretty much written, you know, being the editing was being finalized and um and i had the task of writing the conclusion and i put it off for the whole summer because i really didn't know what to say about hope and joy uh in the summer of 2020 it was a really it was a really hard time um and i ended up um being being enlightened um, with an, another new idea. I mean, for, for me, it like in in my um, earlier chapter in the book, I talk about how just these these ideas from from Ikeda have just you know and, and and from from Buddhism in general have just changed my perspective and um, and how um, perspective shifting based on these ideas have has have opened me to, to hope and joy. And, um, and so the idea um, that was um, shared by the, the group of us who are working on this book and people were kind enough to, to send me um, writings and, um, and, and reflections, um, but the, the idea was poison into medicine, right? Um, the idea that, um, that the same substance right, um, can be destructive or beneficial, um, you know, de depending on, depending on a lot of things, but, um, but a, a lot of it is dependent on perspective, right, and, and our willingness to, to learn and engage and, and accept not in a, a fatalistic way, but in a in an active way of, you know, I will take this poison and I will make it into medicine, um, and and so yeah, I mean that that didn't just help with writing the conclusion, right? That um, that that helped a lot in a a really hard time. Yeah, I'm, uh, thank you for sharing that, Isabel, because for me, that was a really wonderful experience. Um, two things. One is a kind of direct response to your question, Henri, and then second is maybe something you weren't asking, but I think is worth mentioning. In some ways, the pandemic, sort of keeping people in their home, sort of limiting the amount of time, allowed this to be a really dialogically created work among the editors, the editorial team, really talking out ideas, encouraging each other. Um, you know, I wrote a, a chapter that wasn't as good and, you know, got feedback and didn't like it and then, you know, sort of moved forward and um, Isabel sharing that story. And I think all of that was in some ways um, exacerbated by the tension of the moment. And there's no vaccine for the kind of despair that seemed to have gripped uh, so many people uh, for obvious reasons. And you know, I Ikeda says hope is a decision. Hope comes from inside, joy is the same. And that's uh, a kind of strict and uncompromising kind of thing, but it's incredibly empowering and powerful that you have within you this capacity to bring out from the interiority uh, these kinds of perspectives on life, no matter what, even in the midst of horrible trauma, uh, like the kind we're seeing. And so the book took on a new kind of importance uh, in the midst of it. And, um, you know, my own chapter dealt with death and life. And um, I just think, you know, Daisaku Ikeda's ideas around these two concepts are really significant. And he's been writing about them for a long time. And I think they bring something unique to a, a kind of culture that 
in many ways is operating from a sort of Western sort of perspective and his Eastern perspective is unique in this regard. And I think it has even more relevance in the midst of both of these struggles we're facing, the struggle of COVID and the pandemic and these massive you know, hellscapes of sickness and death. And then somehow this, I don't know, this inexplicable, you know, what is it about killing black bodies? What, what, what is going on here? Somehow to make sense of that in the midst of it when there is no sense to be made from it. I think uh, thinking about Daisaku Ikeda's thought on that is, uh, provides a kind of real healing um, in the context of education. And what's powerful for me is that joy and hope are possible in death as well as in life. And that's to learn about them in death really helps us learn how to live more fully, a kind of more expansive kind of life. And in teaching this to my students, I teach classes on Daisaku Ikeda's work, uh, they indicate that that has been a really helpful kind of lens for them in this current moment. And I didn't anticipate it when we started writing. You know, I was writing more about sort of with the thought of mass shootings and deaths of despair and sort of things that were happening before COVID, but uh, it, it took on new relevance for me after the pandemic started and obviously after George Floyd and others. Thank you. Thank you both so much for sharing it really. Um, as I was reading through as well, I could feel, you know, how important it is to be able to bring hope and joy. And I love this um, section that you um, wrote in your introduction, Jay, if, it, if it's okay. I, I wanted to read that too. It says, um, for Ikeda, hope is not passive or wishful thinking. It is engaged and determined. It is to gaze far into the future and desire something deeply and intensely, which um, yeah, that, that really stuck out to me <laughs> and really hit home, um, especially at this time. So um, I know some of the um, participants on the call today, you know, they, um, you know, maybe learning about Daisaku Ikeda for the first time, um, or uh, maybe many of, of the participants already are very familiar with his work. Um, but just one last question is, um, if you can talk about, you know, what the book really does for our understanding of Ikeda, and uh, for readers jumping into his educational philosophy from many different starting points. Isabel, you first. So um, we, we knew that we were introducing, not all, but, um, but many of the authors to um, Ikeda's work. And so, um, and so we sent out a couple of books, which, um, which really I made for a, a lovely um, correspondence among the chapters and, uh, and a coherence among the books. So, um, so I, I think that, I, I mean, it, 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 it makes the, the book as a whole, I think a really, um, lovely and accessible introduction to um, to Ikeda studies and um, and um, and Ikeda's thought. Uh, it from my own work, I mean I I am not um, a Soka studies Ikeda scholar like like Jason is at all. And so um, I I'm still I'm still you know reading and feeling my way and you know figuring out um, which of these ideas are are going to um, are going to change my perspective and change my life and and so many have and um, I I recently um, submitted what I hope was a final draft of a chapter that will be will end up being in um, curriculum inquiry in a special issue on curriculum of gratitude and um, and yeah thinking back to the the wisdom of the Lotus Sutra I mean not only is there a lot in the wisdom of the Lotus Sutra on joy which you know again has been kind of a long-standing 
um, center for my vocation. And so when I read, I, you know, like, obviously that just stood out to me, but there is also a lot on gratitude, right? And, um, and the importance of, of gratitude in, um, in, as a foundation for, for hope and joy. And, and so, and so, I mean, that's my current takeaway, right? Is I've been thinking and writing about, um, about gratitude and its connection to hope and joy. That's beautiful. Um, you know, I think Daisaku Ikeda has been active writing about the field of education and, you know, taking incredible actions in the field of education since 1949. But he doesn't write, I think, specifically targeting sort of academia. His work is really speaking to the people and he has a, a broad uh, reach in a, in a wide variety of areas, peace building and literary commentary, and of course, Buddhist thought and Buddhist leadership, um, nuclear abolition and, and many others. And this brings together a number of people in education to look at his educational ideas. And I think they are bringing to bear on the field of education, the ideas that he's been working with for a long time and now making them accessible for a lot of people. But what's also interesting to me is a number of the voices, not all of them, but many of the voices in this book come from the field of curriculum studies, which already takes a very broad interdisciplinary kind of approach to understanding education. And so it makes sense that these individuals would also draw on Daisaku Ikeda's work. It's not strange in that sense to draw on the work of a, of a Buddhist philosopher or someone who's working in peace building or literary criticism to then bring that into the work of eco-justice or critical race theory or you know, dialogue and education and leadership or you know, all of the other fields that are taken up in the book. Uh, and in that sense, I think this book is um, introducing core ideas that Daisaku Ikeda has been talking about in the context of very real things that we've been talking about for a long time and bringing a new kind of meaning to them. I think that's really important. It may also have an impact on the way people begin to take up Daisaku Ikeda in these other related fields. And you know, the scholarship in those areas uh, em will emerge, I think, in, in like way. Um, and so I'm hopeful. A lot of these people have been familiar with Daisaku Ikeda for a long time. I don't think they've written about them. It's funny, Isabel says, I'm not an Ikeda scholar, but I mean, you read her work uh, and it's, it's, it's great. I mean, it's incredible. So um, you're an Ikeda scholar, <laughs> it's so obvious. Um, so yeah, I think you know, this will, and hopefully this will inspire people uh, to take up some of his ideas, to look at them. I think there's a lot there for people. There are many ideas that weren't even taken up in this book. Uh, and I hope that other scholars will, will look into his ideas. Wow, thank you so much both. Um, so that actually takes us to um, the close of our dialogue portion, but I've heard from my colleagues that we've got a lot of questions from the audience. So if it's okay, um, I'd like to read the first question. So um, the first question is, while teachers and students are grateful for being able to learn online during the pandemic, it has not been a particularly positive or joyful experience for many, especially considering the mental health impacts of the pandemic. What, what inspiration can we draw from Daisaku Ikeda's writings to help teachers best connect with students and bring joy back to the learning experience? So I, I agree. Um, I mean, my own daughter has been um, zooming into classes and she doesn't love it. You know, um, I, I would say that um, the most important thing we can do, I mean, not just while we are, are in the virtual envi environment, <clears throat> but beyond that is to remember that um, that relationship is the is the heart of teaching right so uh, you know rather than um, being too worried right about academics and standards and etc um, you know not that not that those aren't important but um, 
but relationships are prerequisite, you know, um, students need to feel like their teachers know them and see them um, in order to master the standards well. So, so I, I would say that, yeah, we should, we should focus on, on the human connection, our, our, our interdependence um, and the relationships between teachers and students and among students in a class as, um, as a, a priority, whether um, learning virtually or when we all go back. Isabel has this great passage about one of the authors in the book, Michio Okamura, who used to do all these really dynamic, he's a, uh, he teaches in Chicago public schools um, from I think kindergarten all the way up to eighth grade Japanese. And he always does all these exciting things with the students, cooking with them and playing sports. So everything is done in Japanese, but he like, it's all, embodied kind of learning. And the school was telling him that, uh, this is before COVID, before going virtual, that he would have to stop all of the cooking, that the school would be uh, fined thousands of dollars for having to do it, et cetera, et cetera. And then the pandemic happened and then he started doing it. And then they were cooking in this virtual space and parents started to join and families were working together with their children, cooking together, eating together, based on the learning that they were doing in Japanese. And it's a great sort of narrative that Michio shared with us. And I totally forgot about it until Isabel included it in her conclusion. I think the point is something that Ikeda talks about. Daisaku Ikeda often takes Japanese, you know, the words, the characters of the word and kind of adds new characters to slightly change the word a little bit. So one he does is education. And he takes out the character for uh, teach. It's made up of two characters, teach and to foster. And so he takes out the character for teach and he puts in the character for together. And they're homophones, kyoiku and kyoiku. He says education really is the mutual growth of the teacher and the student. If the teacher mm -hmm. is not growing, if the teacher themselves is not transforming in this space, racking their brain. How can I connect with the heart, even through this virtual space of these young learners, treat them as individuals? Something in here has to transform to really create that kind of experience and make in this awful situation, but it is still a great situation of education. Learning can happen. And so we have to create value where it does not exist, Daisaku Ikeda would say. It's not value prescription. It's value creation. And so we have to somehow bring something out. And I think viewing it with this kind of determined hope, the sort of seriousness about joy, I'm gonna make sure that I can have joy in doing what I'm doing. That this inner kind of work can lead to real transformations in the external, even virtual space with students and their families. And that kind of determined work can really transform someone inside and really transform the way education happens. I, I don't think it's just wishful thinking, but I think it is concrete. And we heard a lot of experiences of this kind of thing from uh, they're permeating the chapters and we're, we're hearing them from people who've been reading the book and, and uh, resonating with it. So that's what I would share. Thank you so much. So the second question, if it's okay, is, um, Alfred Whitehead uh, advocates against inner ideas that is so common in our educational system. To what extent can Ikeda's ideas make teaching and learning more fun, as Dr. Nunez just said, and full of hope and joy? What's new and important in his ideas? Mm. <laughs> Do you want to go first? Um. Well, so, I mean, happiness, right? The happiness of the learner as central, I think is, um, I, it's certainly new to the current era, right? I mean, like right now, I don't, I don't hear about that at all. I mean, I, I deal with um, CAPE and, um, and, you know, our, our state um, 
educator preparation standards all day, every day as the director of a school of education. And I, I don't remember anywhere in any of those standards um, it talking about the learner joy, right? Um, I, I mean, if anything, it's like, okay, how can you keep kids engaged in this lesson so that they will learn the academic content? But, um, but I think, you know, Ikeda, um, based on Makiguchi, says, no, happiness is first. That's, that's the, the, the central thing. And, um, and I mean, not only is it the most important thing, I, I don't think the other stuff really happens without it. I mean, it's true. And happiness is not just, you know, hedonistic pleasure or mm -hmm. nihilistic satisfaction. It's real joy that emerges from knowing that no matter the situation uh, and understanding sort of the facticities of life, you can create meaning from them. Meaning that we like, meaning that serves oneself, brings a kind of benefit or a gain to oneself, and meaning that impacts the larger whole, the sort of quantitatively larger scale of that second dimension, enhances this bigger sort of tapestry of life. That's what underpins this idea of creating value. You know? And I think that's one of the unique kinds of concepts that Daisaku Ikeda is bringing to bear on education. So how do we take the knowledge that we're asking students to learn and from it, you know, foster the kind of wisdom, the kind of wisdom that can create value to bring that kind of happiness in their lives and the lives of others. That's a central tenet of his work. But that is part of this larger kind of idea for him what it means to really become human, how to constantly develop the self. This is why he says, you know, we should ask ourselves for what purpose? For what purpose are we doing education? You know? And so mm -hmm. it is to foster that kind of wisdom. He also says courage and compassion. These are the elements of a global citizen. And to be aware, attuned to the fact that our lives are interrelated with and interdependent with those of everyone and everything in the world. And the moment we become aware of that, then the actions we take, the wisdom we cultivate from that knowledge, from that learning, has a much bigger kind of scale. The scope of our life suddenly immediately becomes just massive when we work in that kind of way. And we can foster that kind of understanding in students. That even if they don't leave you know, the four little corners of their neighborhood, they still can have that kind of life state, that kind of condition. And so in one sense, his ideas are, I would say, uniquely Eastern, but they are also quintessentially universal. I think everyone wants that kind of sort of perspective for their child. If you have children, every teacher wants to be able to do that in the classroom. You know, teachers don't want to say, I just want to teach this information and, you know, forget about the rest, you know, like that's, that's probably why most people don't go into teaching. You know, they go in with these real bigger sort of ideas. And, um, you know, the other thing is that Daisaku Ikeda and going back to Makiguchi, for example, they're not saying just throw out sort of everything you have and, you know, just do whatever. You know, it's not this kind of, you know, that sort of approach to education. We have to learn things if we're going to have to, if we're going to be able to foster wisdom. So they, he really does a great job of bringing these two worlds together, I think in very practical ways, philosophical ways, theoretical ways, but also concrete ways. Um, and I would encourage people to read the book because these authors are showing us what that looks like in very specific ways from kindergarten all the way up to higher education in a wide variety of disciplines uh, and in really important ways. So um, they don't have to just take it from me. They should read, read all the great chapters in the book. Absolutely, wow. <laughs> that is so empowering to really be able to, um, yeah, and it will empower <laughs> students to really be able to transform their, their own lives and the society in which they live in. Um, 
So we do have time for one last question, uh, and that is, even educators who want to move in a direction of hope and joy may be constrained by the sense that education work must produce measurable results regardless of the pedagogical framing. In promoting hope and joy, how do you confront this insidious aspect of the accountability mindset that is so deeply rooted in education? Meaningful assessment is possible, right? I mean, we, we seem to have accepted as an education discipline that test scores are how we measure, but, um, but you know, em empirical data has to do with what we, you know, understand through the senses and that's not limited to, um, to, you know, bubbled in answers and, um, and numbers on a, on a Scantron. Um, there are really wonderful examples of, um, of authentic assessments of academic learning, as well as ways to measure more holistic outcomes of educational experiences. And it's expensive, right? <laughs> like um, the reason that we use standardized tests is that they're so efficient and economical. But if we, if if we're going to make a commitment as a society to to future generations, we 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 need to expand our understanding of of assessment and and measurement. You know, Daisaku Ikeda comes from a heritage uh, that includes Tsunesaburo Makiguchi and then in between Makiguchi and Daisaku Ikeda is Jose Toda. And Jose Toda was Daisaku Ikeda's teacher and mentor, and he was a, a wonderful educator in his own right. <clears throat> and he was known as the examination god in Japan. And he uh, was very good at creating an approach to getting young kids to understand the information through a process of deductive learning. And so he would, re, he would resituate the material in such a way that they could build on the information uh, as they were getting new information. So they could draw on what they had to, to do what they were getting. He also had an approach to developing aptitude and recognizing different kinds of aptitude. And he was very good actually at getting these so-called lowest performing learners to become really high performing learners. And he spoke at length about why we actually assess and we should not assess students against each other. That, that, what's the point of that? There's no sort of benefit to that. I don't go into the doctor and ask for my, you know, heart rate to be measured against Isabel. Like, I just want to know my heart rate to know, am I healthy or, or sick? You know, that's the whole point of measuring it. And so his approach to aptitude was very much like that. How can we help this learner as they are sort of improve in the areas that they one, want to improve in and two, we want them to improve and that will help them um, in all the things that we need. We need to get jobs and make money and all of those things, but also to have joy and have a larger sort of perspective in life. And I share all of that because I think that idea is what informs the way Daisaku Ikeda views education. And he has also spoken at length about the travesty of this kind of examination hell when we just put students through this kind of trauma of being evaluated based on a test score that can make or break a student's success, their sense of self, sense of accomplishment, sense of worth. <clears throat> but really, as he says, to view the individual right in front of you, that complex human being right in front of you, to work with that person. Don't judge them based on anyone else. This is a hard thing to do for teachers, but I think if you really gain an understanding of who your students are as individuals, find out what is unique to them. What are they good at? Foster that, stoke the fire in that, you know, really foster that, cultivate that and help that student really begin to grow into who they are and what is possible. I think that's his approach. The one thing that we didn't say in this book that I think is a, a key, an enduring sort of approach from Daisaku Ikeda, which almost sounds kind of like simplistic, his capacity to encourage people, his sort of capacity to just encourage individuals one-on-one. -on -one. 
That I think is what we see when we often go, uh, when we go to the Soka institutions that he has created. That kind of ethos uh, is really present there that people are trying to encourage the person right in front of them. That's often hard to do if you're a teacher in the midst of the imposition of all of these neoliberal things that you're talking about. But um, hope and joy is possible when you have that kind of view of the people in front of you. Wow, thank you so much. That was a great <laughs> um, conclusion. Hope and joy is possible if you believe in the person in front of you. Definitely, when you believe in someone, you know, they can really go so far based on that belief. Um, was there anything before we wrap up that uh, you weren't able to share today that you would like to conclude with at all? Or um, yes, just wanted to give you space to do that. I'm really honored and humbled to, to be a part of this project. I'm honored and humbled by the number of people who are here and interested in this book. And um, I, I've learned so much and, and gained so much from the project. And um, so I feel like I'm the, you know, the luckiest and the, the you know, most um, benefited recipient of like the good that's come here. Um, but, um, but I hope that others can, um, can gain some hope and joy as well from the book. Yeah, I, um, it's exactly the same for me. You know, I, I've respected Isabel uh, for a long time in her work. I've had the opportunity to see her working behind the scenes. Um, she cares a lot about education and advocates for education and educators. And to do a book like this on this particular topic, which, which is really meaningful for me. I mean, I, I do a lot of research on Ikeda. It's been great. And the response from Teachers College Press was um, really gratifying. And Brian Ellerbeck, uh, who we worked with, immediately saw the relevance of this work. And, um, and that just sort of pushed us to run sort of into this work, seeing the kind of response and seeing the response today suggests that, yeah, there was, there was a reason to do it, that it has real importance. And I hope that if people are struggling and suffering, teachers, students, parents, uh, that maybe something in this book will inspire them to not give up on themselves or the, the students that they're working with. And uh, hopefully it'll bring something new to their teaching, some new kind of perspective, some new kind of uh, possibility. I think with Ikeda, everything is a vista of possibility. So I think if, if people approach their job that way, uh, they won't be at a deadlock, no matter how difficult uh, the day-to-day -day work is. Ultimately, at the end, when you see that young life or that older life, depending on the context you're in, when they really sort of get it, um, it's better than any paycheck, you know? And uh, it sort of inspires you for one more day uh, to have hope and joy. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jason and Isabel, for all that you shared with us today and really for being here. And um, we hope all the participants can continue the conversation by reading the book. And um, as we, you know, this concludes the Q&A portion, uh, but I would like to hand it back over to our um, MC, Lillian. And thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much, um, Henri, and thank you so much to our wonderful, wonderful book editors, Jason and Isabel, um, for such an incredible discussion. And I can't see everyone since we're in webinar format, but I imagine we're all applauding um, and feeling so much hope and joy. Uh, I definitely am. And I wish we could continue this conversation for a few more hours. Um, but of course, we all have to um, you know, move on with our days, but I'm definitely looking forward to our next one. And we actually received more than 50 questions. Um, so thank you so much, everyone. We apologize for not being able to get through everything, um, but we will definitely have more conversations around the book. So please look forward to that. Um, and since we're getting close uh, to the end of the hour, I would like to now invite our executive director, Kevin Marr, to share closing remarks. Over to you, Kevin. Thank you so much, Lillian. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for joining us tonight for this deeply inspiring and timely discussion on the new book. And from the participant list, I see many friends joined us tonight, both from near and far, and representing many time zones, including early in the morning on Friday. 
So thank you so much for joining us tonight. What a wonderful way to commemorate the publication of Hope and Joy and Education. Um, to start, you know, in the acknowledgement section of the book, uh, Isabel and Jason begin by writing that quote, gratitude is integral, perhaps prerequisite to hope and joy. I wholeheartedly agree with that statement. And in that spirit, I'd like to share some words of appreciation to conclude our evening together. First and foremost, I wanna extend my deepest gratitude to Drs. Isabel Nunez and Jason Gula for leading us in tonight's engaging dialogue, as well as for the tremendous care and passion you put into the editing and development of this book. It's been an absolute joy to see the book blossom from an idea that was first discussed on a phone call in the fall of 2018 to now seeing it as a finished publication. And in that time between that phone call and to see it as a book, there have been many Zoom calls between Isabel, Jason, myself, my colleagues, Mitch Bogan and Jenny Benson, and then hundreds of email exchanges to discuss and review each step of the process. And in synergy with the center's name and mission, it feels fitting as Jason was sharing that the book itself was developed through extensive dialogue. So thank you again, Jason and Isabel for giving so much of your time and commitment as well as your joy and hope into this, this wonderful project. I'd also like to thank my colleague, Anri Tanabe for being a terrific moderator for, for this event and for organizing um, tonight's dialogue and my colleague Lillian E for joyfully emceeing the event and supporting in critical ways behind the scenes with our, our colleague Priyandra Noel. Um, this launch was a phenomenal success due to the dedicated efforts of our incredible program team and the entire Ikeda Center staff. So thank you so much. In addition, I wanna share special acknowledgement of and appreciation to our publications associate, Mitch Bogan, for his incredible contributions to the production of this entire book. Mitch was an, as, it was an indispensable part of the editorial team and you know, while also managing um, the production of the book, you know, often juggling many, many hats at the same time. And Mitch's passion for the transformative potential of education really came alive in exciting ways throughout the project, including in his inspiring chapter. So thank you so much, Mitch. And I also wanna thank our amazing chapter authors. This has been shared, but I, several of them have joined us tonight. So thank you so much for being here. As was shared in the dialogue, when we began brainstorming on potential contributors back in 2019, um, we put together a dream list of scholars that Isabel and Jay had worked with or knew of their work, um, as well as scholar friends of the center. And to our absolute delight, almost everyone that we invited uh, confirmed that they would be happy to contribute chapters. And reading the book now as a whole, I'm amazed at how each chapter introduces a unique and important perspective to the central themes of reinvigorating hope and joy. And at the same time, how strongly these chapters resonate with one another. It's really beautiful to see it as a, as a finished book. So thank you again. And also we're so deeply appreciative for having had this opportunity to partner again with Teachers College Press. The center has had two previous collaborations with Teachers College Press with Ethical Visions of Education in 2007 and with Educating Citizens for Global Awareness in 2005. And when we began drafting a prospectus for hope and joy in education and discussing potential publishers, our top and immediate choice was TCP without question. And we were thrilled when they accepted the proposal. And they've been just a phenomenal partner to work with both in the development of the manuscript and now in our outreach with their terrific uh, marketing team as well. And we're particularly indebted to acquisitions editor, Brian Ellerbeck, who saw value in this project right from the start and has provided um, essential guidance and support throughout its development. So thank you again to TC, TCP, Teachers College Press. And as was shared in tonight's dialogue, and as highlighted in both the introduction and conclusions to the book, this project began um, prior to the overwhelming uh, challenges of 2020. And if the promise of, of reinvigorating hope and joy in teaching and learning seemed pressing prior to COVID-19 in 2020, 
then it feels absolutely essential now. From the beginning, our goal was to develop a book that would make a unique contribution to the field of education and also serve as a meaningful resource for students, teachers, and parents who are too often struggling to find hope and joy in our schools. And speaking on behalf of the center staff, I can confidently say that the finished book exceeds our expectations due to the inspiring contributions of our editors and each author. In fact, right before we started, um, Ginny Benson, our former executive director and colleague was sharing how she just reread the book and is so inspired by all of the content as we are as well. And, and, and this is a, a comment that was shared, that's shared in the forward to the book by uh, Dr. Cynthia Dillard, who writes, quote, this is a necessary text at a necessary time if we are to re revitalize hope and the promise of education. It is a necessary text at a necessary time when amidst violence, global pandemics, enduring racism, and the often mean-spiritedness of our encounters with one another, we must pause to seriously consider the absolute power of joy, hope, and spirit in the work of teaching and learning. And it's just, um, you know, for me, it's, a, it's such a powerful statement um, to, to begin the book. And, you know, it, it really speaks to um, the, the importance of this theme now. And so to conclude, I would like to sh you know, share deep appreciation to uh, Mr. Daisaku Ikeda, whose peace and educational philosophy inspired the vision for hope and joy in education. And for the center staff, whose work is informed by his perspective and hope-filled hope approach to life and living, it has been a deeply meaningful experience for us to explore his ideas through the multiple lenses that make up this book. And we hope that perhaps inspired by this evening's dialogue that you are moved to pick up the book and to reflect on the moments and places where hope and joy are alive for you. And so I will officially conclude where the book itself opens, which is with a, a haiku poem um, that, that Mr. Ikeda uh, contributed to the book. And in, the, in this poem, he writes, quote, a life lived always with hope is the way of happiness, the way of value creation. So on that note, thank you again for joining us tonight. I will now pass it back to Lillian for some brief announcements. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, and thank you everyone once again for joining us this evening. So um, just a few announcements. Uh, one of the main questions we received tonight um, was how do we order the book? And so yes, for those of you who would like to purchase the book, um, there's some more information um, that we are sharing um, on the slide. So you can see here, um, we have a couple of different QR codes that can be used, um, whether you're joining us from the US, from Canada, or from the rest of the world. Um, and also our staff member Pre um, is also posting the links in the chat, so you can click on those links there. Um, but please remember uh, to use the code Ikeda Launch uh, to get 15% off um, and free shipping. And so, uh, yes, if you haven't, and also um, Pre, if you can go to the next slide, um, if you haven't uh, seen the book cover yet, um, I'm holding it up right here, and it's also in this photo. Um, it completely exudes hope and joy, and so we would love to see uh, you with your books. And so please take a photo, um, just like the one you see on this slide, um, and you can post on social media and tag us at the Ikeda Center, and we will repost um, your post. Um, and so please feel free to also include your favorite quotes from the book, and so we're really looking forward um, to seeing everyone's reflections. And lastly, uh, if you enjoy tonight's discussion, um, if you can go to the next slide, uh, please join us uh, for the 2021 Ikeda Lecture hosted by the DePaul University Institute for Daisaku Ikeda Studies and Education, uh, which will feature a talk by renowned scholar, uh, Dr. Cynthia B. Dillard, who wrote, um, just as Kevin mentioned, the beautiful forward um, in Hope and Joy in Education. So um, you can register by um, scanning the QR code um, on uh, this flyer, um, or please reach out to um, you know, staff members at the Ikeda Center, and we can also direct you to the correct place. And so with that, uh, thank you everyone once again. Um, please have a wonderful rest of the evening and the day ahead. And we really hope uh, to see all of you very soon. So thank you so much. Have a great evening.